Hello everybody and welcome. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are, I hope you are doing well today. I really do. My name is Reese Lindmark and you're listening to The Reese Show. I named it. It's named after me. <laughs> on the show we explore beautiful positive visions for the future. If you have any feedback on the show or would like to learn about these ideas through my newsletter, please go to reeslindmark.com. And of course, if you really enjoy the show, please give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. We really do appreciate it. Thanks. So today I interview Yancey Strickler, who's the co-founder of Kickstarter, and we chat about bentoism, which is this amazing framework for self-coherence and ethics. We chat a little bit about paradigm change as well and how he's trying to create paradigm change. Uh, so really hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. Today I'm speaking with writer, entrepreneur, and friend uh, Yancey Strickler. Yancey is the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter, the author of this amazing book, one of my favorite books from last year, called This Could Be Our Future, um, and is the creator of this thing called Bentoism, which we'll chat about later today. Uh, and Yancey is also the distinguished fellow at um, the Drucker Institute, exploring the future of capitalism and post-capitalism. So Yancey, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thanks for having me, Reese. Yeah, excited to, excited to chat. Um, so... The first thing that I want to dive into is just bentoism, just kind of understanding it. So could you give our listeners just an overview of like, what is bentoism and, and how did you come to that idea? Bentoism is a very simple framework and even philosophy that's about distinguishing dimensions of self-interest. For me, this started with, uh, I was writing a book and uh, my previous career was uh, as the CEO and co-founder of Kickstarter. And so I, I thought a lot about incentives and systems that operate us and that we operate. And, um, and I've been thinking a lot about how it was that we had settled on a definition of self-interest that was very, that was very short-term individualistic and I was also very interested in how we'd settled on the idea that financial value was the most rational form of value. And I felt like these two things were directly connected. And so I spent a couple of years writing and thinking about that. And during the course of that process, I just one day gave myself a simple assignment of trying to draw self-interest. Like, how, what is a visualization of self-interest? And I used a, an icon from the world around us today of the hockey stick graph. You know, just a simple, a simple graph with a, a line sloping up and to the right. And, you know, in that graph, the x-axis is time and the y-axis was self-interest, you know, fame, power, money. And as I looked at it, it suddenly occurred to me that both the x and y axes keep going. That the y-axis goes from me to us. As our, as our self-interest grows, so do our responsibilities. I experienced that going from being a single person to a parent or being a worker bee to an entrepreneur with employees. Uh, and that also the x-axis of time, it also keeps going. It keeps going into the future and, and also it goes into the past as well. And so as, as I like expanded this box, I suddenly had a, a much larger space that I quickly turned into a two by two of, of four dimensions. There was this now me box in the lower left-hand corner which I thought is what I want to need right now. There's this future me box in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the older, wiser version of me that I'm either becoming or not becoming every day by the choices I make. In the top left, the now us box of the people I care about and who care about me, my friends and family. And in the top right, future us, my kids and everybody else's kids. And it struck me that every decision I make leaves a footprint in every one of these spaces. And all these spaces influence me all the time. But yet I'm, I was functionally blind to everything other than now me. Like, of course, I know the future matters. I try, you know, I think about my family as a leader. You think about the, the people you're responsible for. But still, it's, it, it, there is like a default feeling that me equals this short-term individualistic identity. So after I drew this graph, I thought, what is this a picture of? And be, next to it, I, I wrote a very simple description that said beyond near-term orientation. And I, uh, looking at it, it I, I just noticed that that was an acronym for BENTO. And I suddenly saw these four boxes of this simple two-by-two two graph. I saw them as the four compartments of a BENTO box. 
And, and that struck me as perfect because the, the bento box is, because of its compartments and lid, lets you carry a variety of dishes without anything getting spoiled. And I had just read in a book uh, a couple weeks before about how the bento box supports this Japanese dieting philosophy called hadahachi bu, which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full. That way you're still hungry for tomorrow. And so I thought, oh, the, the bento is the same idea, but for our values and our self-interest. And for me, as someone who was struggling to live up to what I thought my future me wanted, wanting to, but often often struggling, um, I thought of this bento as like a, a kind of a tool, a, a tool that would, a kind of a mental scaffolding that would sort of expand the perimeter of my self-interest beyond this sort of passive now me perspective that I've had for most of my life, and instead very deliberately extending my interest zone to include who I'm becoming, uh, to include my, my family and friends, and to include the world that they will live in, because all of those dimensions are impacted by my actions. And so I, I'm, I'm still on a process of 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 incorporating that more and more deeply into my life but I, but I'm like 2 plus years now of living a you know a fairly bentoist lifestyle in terms of thinking of my life from this perspective and I'm still learning a ton from it but it, what it's allowed me to do is to perceive really perceive what what self coherence is for me per, to perceive what an ideal version of myself is and also to to be able it allows me to articulate what a flow state is for me you know when it is i'm at my best and my most impactful yeah cool so that i mean and there's there's a lot there but i just want to highlight a couple different things um a i think it's amazing i mean in this in this podcast we talk a lot about like you know it's all about like complex systems and you know like oh how does like blockchain work and you know like crypto economic incentives and stuff like that and that is those are very complicated and so it's interesting i when i read this and saw this little simple two by two it just got even though it's a very simple idea um it can have so much impact and it has as you noted you've been doing this for two plus years and you and i have been kind of brainstorming working around it for you know six months together or something like that and it just has so much um capability within that simple little two by two in this very interesting and strange way so i think it's just a cool i think it's amazing that the two by two can the simplicity can like lead to complexity um i also really like what you said about you know being functionally blind where you know we are the you know functionally blind the hidden default this idea that like you know, we know that we're supposed to like care about each other and we know that we're, <laughs> that we're all like getting older or whatever, but it's hard to kind of integrate that into day-to-day -day life. And so I think that something like the bento box can really um, push that into us and onto us, which I think is great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I really, you know, I, I really view all humans with great compassion and, and optimism. And I think that we're all trying to do our best with what we know and, and there's a lot that we need to learn and we also need help. We need help to be our best selves. And so I view the bento as like, it's a real, it's just, it's just meant to have utility. It's an acceptance of, uh, of humility, um, of just sort of us as fallible creatures that need support to become all that we want to be. And in the same way that, you know, we have, we go to the gym, you read, you do these other kind of things. I think that there's a similar kind of exercise or work to be done around self-awareness. And there is like the mindfulness awareness of, you know, creating separation from yourself. But I think that this is a different kind of self-awareness that's sort of like, let, let me take stock of where I extend um, and, and, and let me try to be accountable for it and, and to be intentional with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's kind of, as you said, there's a, uh, I think um, awareness is a great term for what this can bring on to and, you know, mindset and things like that. I also think I really love what you said about, you know, that all of us are on all of our respective journeys. And even the folks who quote unquote, do bad things like they are, they, why are they doing a bad thing? Well, it's partially because they're genes and partially because, you know, they were raised in a certain way and maybe had a tough childhood and then got put in this thing. And so this ability to kind of empathize with folks and try to say, Hey, um, there's this very helpful kind of thing that we can just a little simple two by two that we can, that you can use for yourself that might help you be, um, 
be better. And it's helped you and I kind of be better as well, which is, is really cool and interesting. Um, I want to kind of move a bit to the um, something that's also interesting with Bentoism and this Bento box thing is that there is a you can think of it from. Uh, from like a complex systems perspective, from a multi-scale perspective, where it both can operate at the micro individual scale, but it can also operate at kind of the macro kind of company scale. So could you kind of explain how it operates at each of those two scales? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a third societal level scale as well. Um, I mean, basically I see this and I'm, you know, I'm not... I don't know what it means to be an expert in fractals, but I, but I feel, <laughs> but I feel like there is a, and I'm gonna like really misconjugate some words here, but I feel like there's some fractaling <laughs> happen here, <laughs> Fra- uh, where the same way that as individuals we have these dimensions of now me now us, you know that that those same dimensions exist in collective dimensions as well. That like for a nation state, the now me of a nation state is itself the people who live within it. Maybe the now us are its allies or other humans or people that share uh, the same resources. Um, you know, there's a, uh, I just finished writing the afterword for the paperback of the book that will come out in a couple months. And I talk about how the Bento shows us um, how it was that the dominant institutions of the 20th century were constructed, that like education and science are future us institutions, right? They are educating and increasing knowledge for the coming generation. Things like pensions or workplace loyalty were future me institutions. They allowed us to adopt a mindset with some certainty of the future. Um, things like laws and churches and unions were now us institutions that created a, a shared social space where we could have a cohesiveness. And now me institutions are things like economic opportunity and policing, um, things that provide for security or allow people to pursue uh, autonomy. And, you know, the truth is that many of these institutions, pretty much all of them that are not in now me, have been in decline for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so, so there is like a a, a, a map of this that I think I think shapes it at different levels for an organization. Um, the Bento is, is actually extraordinarily useful, and it's just and it's, it becomes a user interface for things you already know. Um, so for a company, it's now me is its mission statement and whatever its current goals are. You know, when I led Kickstarter, we would have generally have an annual goal. We were working towards some metric or a, a qualitative judgment of some kind. Uh, and, and that's what your now me would be as a company. Your The company's future me are its values, which are often most clearly expressed in a kind of brand promise, you know, like Nike's uh, just do it or Apple's think different. You know, you could imagine that uh, to to, to be successful to launch a new Nike or Apple product, it should embody that ethos. And internally, you would expect the company to embody that ethos too. Uh, the company's now us is a super important place because this is where companies lay out their stakeholders. For for-profit companies today, they're really only thinking about shareholders. But for, for progressive organizations and where and what the needs of organizations are going to be moving forward, this is making explicit your customer promise, your employee promise, your investor promise, your community promise, your environmental promise. And then the company's future us is its vision statement, where it wants to be in 10 years. Um, and so I actually did an exercise this week. I teach workshops every week. Um, And and this week, I I taught an exercise where we took the mission, values, vision statements, and customer promises for four giant companies, uh, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And we mapped them onto bentos. And then as people opted into different groups and they had to be the, pretend that they were the CEO of that company. And that they had to use the bento to announce two changes to their existing products and to announce two new products they would launch that would be coherent with their identity, their values, and and what it is that people expect from them. And it ended up being a fascinating process because, um, People had really good ideas, really good ideas. I mean, and, and the people doing this, these are not tech people. These are folks coming to a, a workshop. These are these are folks that come from many different works of, walks of life. Uh, but in this case, you saw that just by knowing the values, the mission, and the customer promise, and putting it into this framework where they're looking to make decisions that satisfy each of those boxes, 
all four of these groups of normal people given in a half an hour were able to generate what I thought to be like super interesting ideas um, for how these companies might move forward. And we're also able to identify like some of the tension points that existed. I mean, one of the things that came away from Apple's like Apple's tools for the mind that advance humankind. Okay. So how does an Irish tax haven match up with that? Like that seems incoherent. And so people are getting to this, these deeper levels of questions. And to me, that shows the, the power uh, of having a real clear awareness um, and the power of having a, a kind of a, a more clear interface or filter um, rather than just like the soft filter of words and feelings um, that, that we often use to, to, to make decisions, especially about like what to build or what to prioritize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Just to reflect both those things, I think that there's. I really like what you said about the societal level. Um, and that afterwards sounds sweet. How you have, hey, you know, the now me are those things. The now me that society has are things that protect safety or whatever, something like you know policing or what have you. Um, and then the future me is something like ah, like pensions, like stuff for our like, hey, you might not want to save now, but you're, we're going to save for you and like your your future me. Um, and then the future us, like doing education, having that as like a big part of of you know the our the initial experiments in the United States is having these massive educational opportunities for folks. Um, and then the now us, what was in the now us box again? Now um, us uh, churches, unions. Mm. I think the justice system lives there. I mean, I mm. think I think it's worth I think it's worth reflecting that many of these institutions were created after the Great Depression. Uh, I mean, not not all, but but they were definitely strengthened, and and you could imagine that perhaps the Roaring Twenties, you know, a time of great materialism, uh, that maybe that is a like now became a more now me oriented period of time, um, mm-hmm. and so and so there, you know, after a crash generated by that, then you have this counter reaction. Uh, of wanting to build. I mean, I, I'm reading the fourth turning right now, which is so. Uh, I, the cycle theories are in my brain, um, but but uh, but yeah. But I, I think it, I think it is. I think it is a, a relevant way to think about things. And and I and I think like uh, imagining these dimensions of self interest on a society societal level is helpful because it allows it'll, it 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 creates more clarity to these kinds of non-financial investments that we're making, right? We tend to think of government money uh, as spending rather than investment because it's creating non-financial returns. But government funding is investments. They are investments into non-financial values, and they are investments into areas of our self-interest that are not purely short-term individualistic. And we need institutions like these because as individuals, we struggle to do this, right? And so past generations reached a breaking point where they recognized this. They created these institutions and then we took them for granted. Then those in power use their power and money to effectively wage a war on government and to sabotage it from within over the last 50 years. Now you have the disaster of COVID and like more distrust in government than ever before. And, and I, I think the explicit goal of this is for private companies to step forward and lead as a result of this. And, and that that was the intention. And, and the sad thing is, that, and as I think that comp- it might be that companies do have to do that, that this plan of like, uh, of delegitimizing, um, government and, 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 and sort of removing the power of those institutions might play out, but that's a whole side digression. Any, anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> I think and that's, uh, let, uh, let's uh, put a pin on that. Cause I think that's something that you and I might, um, disagree or yeah, I might disagree on. I think that there's a, but I really like what you said about, I mean, if you think about a lot, this is just like the decline of civil society stuff. And you know, like Robert Putnam's bowling alone, where you're just like, Oh, we used to have all these things, um, where we had this like robust kind of civil society. And now we We've lost that because it's hard to measure something like social capital, you know, and it's hard to like put in because of that, you don't see people like putting money in and expecting this like financial return. It's like, well, the return is in social capital, which like is just more difficult to to think about. And I do I do also like what you said about back in the day, we were just better at like helping future people, um, helping future us. When you think about small things like trees, like we have so many beautiful trees on our like on my block. And it's like, oh, someone planted that like 50 years ago. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's I, I really appreciate it. Um, I also like what you said about, yeah, I think that there's a, 
Yeah, so thinking about this idea, yeah, let, let's not go too down deep down that rabbit hole of, or actually, let's 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 explore for a second this idea that you just talked about about this um, hollowing out of government and um, you know from the outside in, and that these companies are going to have to step up, you know, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, what have you. Um, they now have maybe a lot of the power, and so they have to actively step up and like do things, do quote unquote good things from a COVID perspective. Do you think? I mean, my my macro take here is that. Um, something like government is just, um, it is based in this old kind of, um, industrial age paradigm that, uh, involves centralized trusted institutions and that we are going to transition to a, hopefully a good future in which public goods are still provided for, in which we have this robust civil society, but it will be done in this kind of like digital network first way. Um, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know. I think to say that government is bad because of the state of the United States government is to say is is like saying companies are bad because you work at a shitty company. <laughs> you know, I mean, not not to say that that is America truly, but at, right now it's not a very well run company. And and so my counterpoint would be there are a lot of really effective governments in the world. Yeah, there are a lot of them. Uh, and they're not completely rebuilt to be decentralized. I mean, some of them are, right? Some of them are. Some, some, in, some Asian uh, nation states are like that. But others are fairly centralized and just have high degrees of trust. So uh, I, just the fact that there are so many, so many comps that are positive just says to me that that's not the issue here. You know that, that that's not really the issue. It is it is the good faith pursuit of government that is the issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm mostly convinced by that. I think. Well, a on on your note of just the government being run poorly, um, that was something. While I was listening to NPR um, the other day, the um, they were talking about the recent decision by the Supreme Court to um, say that DACA is is not uh, not okay, and the reason why they did it is only because it was just like run out in a. It was because it was done in a non um, legit in a in a non what was the term they used, but like it just wasn't done in a kind of legitimate, just like well run way. It wasn't an actual issue with the 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 content, but it was at the kind of like the meta level, just like the process is, was like run super poorly. And I guess that that's happened in a couple other Supreme Court decisions with respect to Trump, where they're just like this was just done poorly. <laughs> I mean, so, imagine. Um, I mean, to think of the performance of government over this period of time. Imagine, imagine if like. Microsoft, the whole time it's been around, it was it was like actually that seven of its top ten executives secretly worked for IBM. They secretly worked for IBM. They worked for their competition, and they were trying to uh, sabotage everything Microsoft tried to do. Like I think that that is the state of our government, and has been the state of our government for a while. And so that is a, that is an impossible place. I mean, any organization that's an impossible place to be, and as an institution, it's really really difficult because the, some of this is being achieved through democratic means. So, so I would just say it's just, um, yeah, the the U.S. is in a is in a very tough position, and I think by design, I think by design, and um, and it's it's not clear how to undo it, except that there are going to be. I mean. There are a couple interesting things that, um, you know, there's a, there's a great, there's been a lot of concern about the electoral politics of the U.S. moving forward because of the high concentration of people in seven states, right? Seven states account, account for over half the population. They will within 20 years, something like that. And those states account for like less than a third of electoral college votes. Well, you know, in a post-COVID world where maybe cities are less, uh, are less habitable, you know, there could be a great migration, that changes that, that equalizes that, um, you know, that that begins to resort those politics. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot that shows that younger generations have very different beliefs. Um, so I, I can imagine the next, the next, I think the next 10 years will be challenging for the U S then I think, uh, a new generation with a different set of leadership standards will take over. Um, and it might be that at the, the, at the exact moment that they put the final brick into the perfect new system is like when the biggest tidal wave from climate change will hit, <laughs> right? Right at that ex at the exact moment that you finish like spit shining the window, <laughs> they just as it finishes shining, they look in the reflection and see the tidal wave coming. I feel like it's it's that kind of it's it's that kind of play that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, COVID is round one and climate change is round two. Um, and I think just for listeners to note, I think that um, if you want to explore kind of what Yancey was talking about there with these um, people um, within the companies kind of hating on each other and how that is representative in government, check out like v- Vitocracy, Vitoocracy. That's a good way to think about this. Also on uh, what Yancey was talking about with these, some of these great strong states, there's a um, upcoming uh, idea called Strong State Libertarianism, uh, which is, uh, you know, pushed by folks like Tyler Cowen and what have you, um, that gets at these concepts. And then also check out, definitely check out Audrey Tang in um, Taiwan. I think she does a great job there. They do a great job of um, connecting government to civil society and through these interesting APIs in this kind of beautiful way. Um, so with that, Yancy, what I want to do is kind of move away from that macro perspective and just do a, a funny exploration with you here for a second, which is to, to try for each of us um, speaking from our future me's. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to, I will be future Reese and I will talk in an older voice or something and you can be future Yancey. Um, and I, and we can just speak like this. We'll, we'll try it out for a couple of minutes and we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, so hello, future Yancey. I am future Reese. Um, future Yancey, how are you doing? And also how is young Yancey doing kind of what advice would you give to him right now? Um, well, I mean, he's always doing his best. He's always doing his best. Um, you know, the, that's the one thing I always appreciate, uh, uh, about, about the younger me, um, I feel like was, was always well-intentioned. Um, you know, I mean, the things that I, uh, have always told, told Yancey to keep in mind, um, one is, is just, I, I've always had a strong instinct towards wanting to bring people together. Um, at, at worst, this becomes conflict avoidance. At best, this becomes an ability to create harmony between people. And so that's something that um, I, I always reminded Yancey of and encourage him to do. The other thing that I don't know what it is or where it first started, but I've just always, always just really been very protective of my values and especially is how they relate to money. I've, I've always had this strong instinct. I think it comes from the kind of music I listened to as a teenager, but this strong instinct to, to not sell out to like, if you do something good, like just appreciate it. Don't try to exploit it. Don't try to remove yourself from the group. Like that's, that's the lamest thing you could do. So I'm, I'm always telling that, that, that Yancey to, to keep that in mind. And I, I think they do a pretty good job of that. How about how about you? How about you, old Reese? What, what's going on? Where are where are you right now? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, I am. I'm sitting on a nice porch swing, you know, enjoying the outdoors. You know, my grandkids are running in the in the field <laughs> with butterflies, and so I'm doing well, you know, hanging out um, with my my future wife who is also old um and it's uh, i'm doing well i think and, and the thing that i would tell you know that i just i think a lot about what you said and what you recommended to your your young self and you know i think a crucial part of what you recommended is this kind of superpower shadow dynamic where you can say hey um you know we know that we have these um these things that are super true to ourselves that are both what really good and really bad and as you said your one of your superpowers is to bring people together um and that's awesome but it also can be a, a shadow in that you know it can be kind of conflict avoidance and so i think kind of reminding your 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 past self or your current self that you know that you know those superpowered and shadow dynamics exist is very important um I think of, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about the other things that I would tell my, my past self at this point in time. I think that the, the values and money thing is something that's interesting to not sell out. Is there kind of a shadow? I'm curious, you know, uh, future Yancey, old Yancey, do you, is there a shadow there where it's like you don't try to make enough money or, or, is, or is the not selling out more important? Yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, definitely. It, it's, it, it is a, um, the shadow is having a value of non-optimizing money. Not in, and not in a way of not being wasteful, not in a way of being wasteful, because I have a, a high degree of respect for money and I'm quite, you know, careful with it. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it is a, it is viewing the optimization of money as a negative. And so I actually have had to sort of come to terms with that in the last couple of years of, of just sort of, um, you know, just, just trying to get closer to my own discomfort and, uh, cause I don't think it, I think it help. it's helpful in some ways, but yes, it is a shadow. I mean, one of the, one of the things that, 
uh, that uh, the younger version of me learned soon after making the bento. You know, I, I that person express used the bento to express their values and to write out what they cared about and produce something that is actually hanging in front of them right now, mm-hmm. and and list their values. And it's something that you know I feel proud of when I look at. But there became a day when I realized that each of those values that make me feel proud are also my weaknesses. Every single one of them, every single one of them. And, and, um, and it was kind of, it was crushing to see because you tell yourself, all right, if I just stay, if I just hold on to these things, I'm good. I'm good. But then I, as I looked at them closer, I thought, Oh, so for instance, yeah. Uh, creating harmony that, that leads to conflict avoidance or my now me says to show people the matrix and that might lead me to talk instead of to listen. Or my now us is about deep time with a core group of friends, which also means like I'm a terrible acquaintance. I'm very bad at like light time or light, light sort of chatter. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, this process you do of identifying what's most important to you, unwittingly, you're also finding out what are your, what are your Achilles heels? What are the ways that you're liable to sabotage yourself? Um, and really it's kind of by like pushing too hard on one of your superpowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, well, let's um, let's boop, boop, let's go out of character now. We're back to reality. I can be my normal current self. Uh, thank you for exploring that, Yancy. I think that that was fun, um, and I think that hopefully gave you the leader, the the listeners also a little bit of an exploration of what that could look like. Kind of your future self talking to your current self and recommending to him or her, hey, here's how to think about things, or you know, don't forget to to be with your values or things like that. Do you have anything bonus to say on that, Yancy? Yeah, I mean, I do a, I think we'll mention it later, but I do a weekly ritual um, on Zoom with people. But part of it is a meditation where we see these spaces and I give sort of instructions of what it's like to look at your older self. And I, I find I find those sorts of personifications and, um, and rituals to be really helpful to trick my mind. Um, and who knows if it's even tricking, but to, to get my mind to adopt a, a different personality. Um, and so, so I, I find that to be a very powerful way to learn things that I think that I didn't know that I thought. Learn things that you think you didn't know that you thought. I, yeah, learn things that I think, but I didn't know that uh, I, that I was, that I, that I thought them, right. You're, you're yeah. like uncovering feelings that you were unaware of that are, that are absolutely, uh, you know, there. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you're, you're in like a part of your room and you're like, oh, I didn't know this was here. Oh, cool. Thank you, future me for helping me find it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is the it. part of the podcast where I seek the least articulate ways to express things. So <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Um, so let's let's um, transition then to uh, something that I want to chat about that you and I have um, collaborated a bit on is this idea of how bentoism relates in kind of this, you know, um, abstract philosophical perspective um, to these ideas of just like paradigms and and values and things like that. And I think it's interesting because, you know, for the listeners, it's not like Yancey's just building, um, you know, it's some like the next Kickstarter or whatever, where it's an app that you can use on your phone and like, boom, now you're like, a, you know, a bentoist or whatever. So could you kind of tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, how bentoism relates to an app and especially thinking about this, uh, this piece that you wrote recently on the value stack and, and how bentoism relates to that value stack? Well, you know, during during my period of researching the book, I was just trying to think a lot about how change happens. And and I had a firsthand experience with change happening through Kickstarter, watching crowdfunding enter the world and just having a sense of what it feels like when that happens. Um, and in some sense, you know, be, many more people have a far greater sense than I, but some sense of, of yeah, of, of what it takes and how that how that occurs. So. Um, you know, I, I think that there are these, uh, deep assumptions that we base the world on. Um, but, you know, taking from Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm that he introduced in uh, the structure of scientific revolutions that, um, there become crisis moments where the world stops working the way that, uh, we think it's going, that we think it should, and during these crisis moments, they force us to look deeper. And one way I, I illustrate this, how it, how it impacts um, values and, and really how it impacts behavior is to imagine 
values as like a as a, a part of our emotional shared uh, operating system and that uh, values guide our behavior and values like the value of transparency or the value of uh, of good design or the value of uh, diversity uh, that when those values emerge in culture they then get expressed as rules uh, so laws you know everyone must follow this like this value is so important we are now determining how it must be expressed and then on top of rules it's expressed as incentives where you're trying to celebrate that value so you're celebrating the most transparent companies or the most diverse companies and through this sort of carrot and stick of rules and incentives that are expressing a moral belief that is how you turn like these moral values into action and, and in my book, I explore exercise as an example of that. I've written blog posts about transparency as an example of a, of a value that emerged after Enron and, and problems of companies uh, being corrupt. Then it had to be answered by uh, shifting a core value and saying actually being uber transparent is what we must all adopt to, to counteract this. Um, so I think that these things are constantly in flux. Uh, they're constantly in flux. And... And as I like researched and thought about this and, and, and read a lot, I really came to feel that the root assumption um, that needed to change was this idea of our self-interest. Because in a world where only now me matters, like there are, there are only a certain set of choices that are rational. And, and a lot of the world is defensible from that perspective. And I, and I don't, I don't think the world is an evil place, but like a lot of the things that don't work out for us are defensible from a now me perspective, but they're, but they're not defensible if you see this larger point of view and this larger point of view that I think is real and, and that I think is teachable and that can be adopted as a kind of cultural norm. Um, I'm very influenced by uh, Danella Meadows, who wrote um, The Limits of Growth and, and wrote an amazing essay about places to intervene in a system. And she really sees the paradigm and values layer as the place to intervene in a system, because if you can change one of those core assumptions, um, then every other system that is based on that core assumption will have to, will have to rewrite itself to once again be rational with the world as it exists. So if we were to, if it were to become a mainstream point of view that our self-interest is not individualistic, that we are actually four dimensional creatures, there's a now, a future, a single, an individual and a collective, um, that it would then force all of our other choices to then be filtered through this thought of like, well, how does it work out for our future selves? How does it work out for other people? And I think even just the addition of that step in a lot of other processes would answer a lot of what we need. I, I believe a, 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 a expanded spectrum of self-interest produces an expanded spectrum of value. Right, because a, a world uh, that can be reduced down to just a short-term individualism is also a world that can be reduced down to a financial determinism and to uh, uh, economic and, uh, metrics. Um, and instead, a world that is multidimensional, well, then suddenly you have a dashboard that has more than one metric. And, and maybe you're not just looking at top-line growth stats, but you're also looking at kind of debugging stats, where are the signs that something could be wrong in the system. And these kinds of things sound complicated, uh, and they are more complicated than, say, what we've had in the past, but the world is more complicated than what we've had in the past. And, and there is a great argument to be made, as, as you've made, Reese, in your, in your We Need to Talk essay, that, you know, we are on a, a steady progression of, of a, like a raising of consciousness. And, and to me, the notion that seeing ourselves as bigger than our individualistic uh, immediate selves is a logical next step and one that is very much in line with what the internet and turning us into a networked species uh, has shown us. So, so I think that this, that we are on this path. Um, I think that, that we are on this path, but there, it isn't being articulated as what's happening. And that if we specifically articulate this as what's happening and then start to lay out goals of like, what is the, what is a good outcome of this? What should we be working towards? Um, then I think you have the, you have the possibility of, shaping our systems very deliberately around this different view of who we are as people, of who we are as a society. And, and I think that's what's going to happen over the next 30 years. Like I, I'm, I'm convinced that this, that this is happening and that 
it's it's generations X, Y, and Z that are going to have to redesign and rebuild the world after COVID, if there ever is an after COVID. And, and I believe the most important thing about that work is that it is based on a foundation of us as four dimensional beings. And and if that happens, then we're going to see a world of like uh, values and metrics for all kinds of things. We're going to see a world where goods are distributed for non-financial reasons. We're going to see a world that gets weird. You know, there's going to be the dystopian, you know, China social credit system versions of these things too. I, there is, I cannot promise a utopia, but I, I do think that this is a, a system that better meets our needs and that better reflects where we actually are. Yeah, yeah. So I like. So thank you for that explanation. I like a lot of what you said there, and some of the things that we've, you know, uh, that the, when we've chatted about in the past, it's like all you're doing is you're changing this like single bit at the very top, or just like go from one dimension to four dimensions, like zoom out just a tiny bit, and then that will trickle down and have all these crazy impacts on all the other things. Um, that's that's what we kind of mean by and what Yancey means by like paradigm here, or like these things that are even underneath values, like even our values are informed by by this kind of underlying mindset. I think, um, and I. I I think also what you said, which is like you're convinced. I think you and I are both convinced that it's kind of inevitable that something like this is going to happen. Like we have to either care, care about future us and climate change or like, you know, the exper- the human experiment ends. And so um, seeing this as kind of an uh, a, a, a inevitable thing, I think is true. But I think articulating it and getting people to realize, whoa, like the this is water thing of like, oh, this is where we're going and this is where we're at, I think is really power- powerful. Do you think and this is kind of like a skeptical perspective here? I think someone who... Um, you know, maybe folks who d- deal with me a lot um, and deal with my abstractions might be kind of unconvinced of like, okay, so, you know, you and Yancy you're chatting about this bentoism thing. It sounds all good, but like, how does it actually, so Yancy, tell me like, how will it actually be articulated in, like, will this have any impact on society? It's like, if, even if people are more bentoist, like, how does that actually turn into, you know, goals and things that are actually articulated in society? Is it, you know, how, how does changing the mindset actually have an impact on real people's lives? Well, I think that if the if 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 we adopt a different view of self-interest and say that's adopted inside significant corporations, say that's adopted inside the lives of, you know, ordinary people and influential people and that creates meaning for them. Um, I think that that's a language that can really uh, extend. And, you know, I. I, again, I just think of it, like you said, of this, like, uh, of just changing these, it's almost like the inverse of Y2K, like you're changing these, this one digit to four. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just see a chain of events that, that happen off of that. I mean, you know, I, I've been teaching workshops for over a year and I've taught them to several thousand people at this point. I do three a week on zoom since COVID and, um, and so I've seen like the the level of meaning it has had for people and is having for people and people at all levels. I mean, people assume that um, because I'm asking people to think about their future selves, that this must be some like rich privilege shit. Right. Um, and I would say that that uh, that might be true of some people who are using this. But the, the, the group that comes to these to these sessions, they are uh, extremely diverse from from all all levels, all countries, all backgrounds. And and it's just providing utility um, to really, you know, help them articulate what it is that they want out of life and, and how it is that they might get there. So I think that systems that provide that kind of value are contagious. Um, and that one, like the bento, which works best if families are operating from the same page or organizations are operating from the same page. I think that this is just simple enough of a language that say saying to someone, Hey, like, you know, I wish I could, but future me is not going to like that. And that that's something that's understood um, and that we see our choices and see our lives and see our world in that kind of way. You know, I, I don't think it happens from, you know, just being on this podcast. I don't think it happens from each individual action. Um, but I think that a momentum around an idea like that is, is I don't know, I, I, can, I can see it. You know, I, th- I think it happens through... It just first has to happen by it actually providing value to people's lives. And, and if it can do that, and, and I am, you know, I'm here to tell you with 10 out of 10 certainty that it does do that, um, then it can grow. Right. And, um, and so where I see it having value now is it's people becoming more clear on who they are and what they want out of life. Uh, this also happening inside organizations and, and, and just becoming a, 
creating a more clear operating manual and a, a user interface. This is the thing is it's a UI. You look at the boxes, you, you check a decision against the box and against what you've articulated as important to you in each box. And it's not going to give you a, a perfect answer. Um, but it's going to give you a strong sense of, of, of what, of what to do. And the other, and the other way it's expanding. I mean, it's also, it's the Bento is a, it's simply a foundation, a platform to be built upon. I mean, Reese, you've built upon the Bento idea in your writing. And there's a piece this week from a guy named Mark Annette uh, or Arnett who expanded the Bento into the past and talked about, and, and so instead of a Bento of four boxes, made a Bento of six boxes and created past me and past us and talked about the importance in conflict resolution of bringing the past and the now in alignment with one another. And I thought that was a brilliant insight, right? And so this is something that it's still being added to, right? This is simply a text for us to make sense uh, of the world that we live in. And, and, and the way that, you know, Kuhn writes about we need paradigm changes when the world stops making sense according to the way we're taught it should work. And we are like, we are so in that crisis moment uh, right now. And so what is a way uh, to see ourselves and to see our place in the world in a way that, that does seem to line up with how the world actually works. And I think the bento, and especially just these ways that it's evolving based on other minds and other experiences, has a far, you know, I, I think that has a real chance to, to deeply reflect in a way that is like both personal and universal, sort of what's going on inside each of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for saying, and I, and you, I, you know me, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a bento maximalist, you know, <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a great thing. And I think, you know, especially from that language perspective, it's an incredible thing. So, um, we're out of time for today. So I guess I want to, um, a, again, thank you, Yancy, for coming on for chatting about this stuff and B, what should, if people are interested in learning more about bentoism, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, they could check out bentoism.org, um, which is, a website that teaches takes you through the process of building your bento uh, and also provides links to the weekly events that happen to the slack group uh, to the newsletter and blogs there's there's a lot that you can get into if you want to go deeper and please do like i'm always host these things i'm going to do another one here in just a second and they're they're wonderful like i get so much out of them and have so much fun with them and and i'm sure if people join they will too yeah, yeah, and I just want to rep that for my listeners as well. I mean, um, yeah, I think that for yourself, just doing the bento exercise, it takes like, you can do it in like 15 minutes and just be like, oh, what does matter to me? What does my future me tell myself? And then you're like, oh, wow, this is actually a, a, a surprising amount of clarity. Um, and so you can you can do it once, you can do it, you know, like Yancy and I do every week, and it's, and it's a pretty helpful way to just kind of check in with yourself. Um, and then the other piece with these weekly bentos, yeah, they're a nice thing. And I especially like thinking them of them as like not screen time, but rather as this kind of like meditation ritual time where you get on, you know, this Zoom call of folks and technically everybody's on a screen. You say hi to everybody's face at the beginning, but then most of the time is actually, you know, doing some of these closed eyes exercises or doing, you know, some stuff on just like pieces of paper and thinking about, you know, your bento box. And so it's less of just like, a, oh, here's another Zoom call to get on. It's much more like a um, connected spiritually with others in this space um, and, and taking some time to make sure that you're uh, you're aligned with your past and, and future selves. Um, so with that, again, thank you again for coming on, Yancy. Please, everybody, check out bentoism.org. Um, and also, and if you're into it for yourself or if you're into it for your company, um, definitely feel to reach, reach out to Yancy there. Uh, thanks again, Yancy, for coming on. Thank you, my friend. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Bye.